time, I would like to turn today's program over to Steve Dine, Managing Partner, Data Source Consulting. Steve, you may begin. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to talk about enabling AI with data virtualization. And, and a big part of why we're talking about that today is both Agile and data virtualization. Our hot due to the increased pressure by the business to deliver faster, which we're all, all seeing pressure. We're going to start, actually, by taking a quick poll. I kind of want to get that poll. And really uh, to know uh, if you're currently or you're planning to use Al within uh, your environment today. And so we'll have a couple minutes or at least 20 seconds for you to respond to that poll, and the results should come up right afterwards. that's being taken, what we're seeing in around our customers is an usage of agile uh, methodology for business intelligence. And one of the challenges that, that everybody encounters is you know, how to adapt agile to work well with business intelligence, because obviously agile was built as a, or created as a software development methodology. And based on the results, it looks like about a little over 80% of, of attendees are using Agile in some form in their organization. background about data source. Works in company focused, uh, obviously, on data integration, but also business intelligence. Uh, we all, uh, within the organization, uh, one of the differentiators in our company is we've all come to the ranks of, of building and running, managing uh, by programs within those organizations. We're not a channel partner. We work closely with uh, a number of organizations in our industry, and we have a wide range of integration services, anything from assessments all the way through uh, strategy and implementation. So what's the big challenge everybody's facing today? It just takes long to deliver business intelligence and what we do. Part with, uh, with delivery is that we meet with the business, we bring uh, the business requirements and tend to go through, in the past, a waterfall methodology for delivering. And one of the challenges, obviously, the length of time it takes to deliver. And being a report from TDWI, the response, we did see respondents come back with a decrease in the number of weeks it takes to implement new data sources uh, in reports. But the bad news is that at least a third of taking more than three months to deliver. And even though we're reducing the amount of time that we're delivering, still eight weeks we're finding is more than the business is willing to wait. So, Steve, why don't we do a, a quick poll on on what uh, others are seeing uh, as far as long as it's taking to get new data sources and, and uh, new attributes into their uh, into the repository of data. Excuse me, repository of data. So uh, uh, take a look, look quick at the poll questions. Um, we've got uh, from one week to three plus months. And as you can see from the TDWI uh, report, it's it's averaging pretty high. And I think uh, um, we're finding as we talk with customers that uh, we see quite a bit of, uh, of delay in getting data uh, to the bulls ended. Let's see what the numbers say. A bit of a delay. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, like on average, uh, one to two months or more, um, half, uh, or around half is uh, one to two months or more. Steve, uh, do you find that with your customers that they are uh, are saying, the, giving you that type of feedback that they're taking that long? 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, generally it takes that long, if not longer. Oops, the poll came up on my screen as well. But yeah, we, okay. we tend to find that you know, obviously depending on the scope of the project and the scope of how much how much data is looking to be brought into uh, an integrated house, it just takes anywhere from you know in those environments anywhere from, from one to three months. Um, basically, we're finding that you know anything in this more than three months is uh, you know business users are generally looking elsewhere. Do you the um that the business users are having to look elsewhere or or just you know doing to get their job done because IT takes so long to to, to turn projects around or just to even start on the projects like is there a sort of a lag in getting to the projects or um it just takes a long time to to manage the project that's a great question and, and I would probably say both um depending on the environment but you know, one aspect is, you know, are the resources available when requested? Uh, and second is, we do see it where they do start working on the project, but it just takes so long to deliver. And we'll talk about that in a few slides about in business involvement and they're not involved all the way through the cycle. Great. Okay, thank everyone for the, the input. So, you know, does traditional data creation take so long? Well, you know, part of the process that we've generally run and the architectures that we've created for delivering integrated data you know, are made by the business. And then we go through a whole development cycle where we're bringing data in uh, through developing through, through multiple layers in the data integration architecture. Uh, generally, anywhere from two to four layers, we see in a lot of different, different architectures. And we go through that development cycle, and then we go into a test QA cycle and, and larger amounts of data to mimic production or, or, or load it into test queue it. A lot of times we're waiting for for the DB to physicalize the tables out in those environments and prepare them for loading the data. And really the business doesn't see that data until it gets into production. So from day zero where the request is made until its final delivery, in all cases we don't see the business interacting and they're not getting that data in that meantime. And so there's that, that big development timeline that occurs where the business in a lot of cases starts looking elsewhere for other ways to get that data themselves. One of the challenges that we have is that the that additional development processes, they generally include the business throughout the process. And so the businesses make the request, requirements, and then we go off and do IT stuff. You know, we're out data building, designing the ETL, developing it. We just talked about through all the layers of the architecture. And the front-end developers are out, out developing. In a lot of cases, they're developing with, you know, with data that doesn't mean anything to the business. And the users go in and they review that data. And by the time they review that data, they're starting back investments. And then we organizations tend to go off the process again. They go through the modeling effort, the ETL effort, the front end effort, and then users review. And we get through these into long cycles of redevelopment. And of what causes the length of time, but also explains why the business doesn't have enough interaction process. So the question is, you know, what do we do now? The traditional approaches don't work, and it's taking long and the business isn't involved. What solution? Well, a lot of companies are turning to Agile. And we describe Agile as a small A Agile. There's the Agile methodology, which is what I would consider to be capital A Agile. And then there's the components of Agile that we can start integrating into our BI effort. But for those that aren't using Agile, just a quick review, essentially how we go through a preparation phase. And in the B world, we traditionally will have an iteration minus one or an iteration zero. And start a process of going and doing what we call sprint planning, where we're meeting with the business, business is planning stories, and then we're agreeing on what's going to be delivered in a shorter period of time. And so they agree upon during sprint planning what's going to be delivered and what still needs to be something that's usable by the business. And EA, the entire, including the business, meet during daily scrums to talk about what they did today, what they plan to do today, whether they have blocks, and what any follow-ups need to be 
follow-up on. So each day there's a lot of communication that occurs. And throughout those scrums, we look and we, as we're talking about what's being accomplished, manage that in what's called a sprint burndown chart and can see exactly how we're tracking to that sprint in the delivery cycle. Now, the question a lot of people ask, and it's a one, which is, well, that's great, and it's great, but how do you deliver? If we're 10 to 30 day iterations, or faster in some occasions, how do you achieve that? It's not just a matter of everybody working harder and faster. There has to be ways to speed up that process, and that's an area where, which is why I call it small agile, where we start adapting what's done in agile to what we do in BI. Because we have a lot more dependencies in what we do that in some cases in the software development side, those dependencies are strong. And so don't hold up the projects. In our cases, they do. So one solution to that is utilizing data virtualization. And data virtualization has gone through a lot of change over the years. And a lot of that change has been in what we call it. So it started out as data federation. We used it 12 years ago. Um, I was working at a, at a large manufacturing company, and running a group. We used data virtualization back then. Only back then we called it data federation. Uh, went into the EIA phase, where enterprise information integration, and now, now we're talking about it as data virtualization. But my favorite describe data virtualization is really Rick Vanderland. And if you haven't had a chance to pick up Rick's book, he has a great book on data virtualization. But his definition is really sort of the core, and I think it describes very well of what it is. And we're going to break apart a little bit and talk about the components. Uh, so when we talk about the technology offers consumers a unified, really unified in this case means one endpoint to access the data. And why that's important is that we can start bringing users in through one access layer. And we can see what users are out querying and what helps taking for things to come back. And we'll talk about creating a semantic view and, and one sort of there for everybody to come through that have consistent business rules in a few minutes. Secondly, it's abstracted, and that really means that it's not dependent upon the source application or database or technology. So it provides a unified way to access data that abstracts it from the underlying data sources because the underlying data sources could be files, it could be relational databases, it could be mainframes, it could be XML files, it could be web service, it could be really anything. The aspect is that it encapsulates it's the view, meaning that all the structures, the business rules, the data type, every, all the differences are really hidden from the consumers. So we don't have to worry about couldn't data types to make things come together when they want to query data. They don't have to impart all their own business rules into the queries that they're running or as their data out, which we tend to see in front-end semantic views like microstrategy or business objects where we're building all these business rules into the data only is valid for those applications. And last, it's heterogeneous. Now, it may be heterogeneous, meaning that you don't necessarily, through data virtualization, have to do queries across different types or different data sources, but it could be stored in different structures, it could be stored in different locations and or formats. Now, it's not sufficient for the data warehouse, which is really my favorite quote and something that I try and to everyone that I talk to about data virtualization. There's always a big concern that data virtualization is going to replace the data warehouse. The truth is that there's aspects to what data virtualization does very well, and there's aspects to what a data warehouse does very, very well. BI practitioners, we have to understand what those usage patterns are and, and, and design effectively to meet those. And so to us, what I would consider data virtualization is to be really a tool in our tool belt. And I really like that quote, too. One of the things that I found when I started working with data virtualization years ago is that I think it's really being <clears throat> driven more from uh, um, vendors that are uh, trying to say, you know, you can use data virtualization for everything, um, appropriate uses for it and inappropriate uses. And um, probably the worst case is trying to create a virtual data warehouse and uh, um, Garner has come up with the term of a logical data warehouse, which fits well in it being more of a hybrid. And I think that's really the sweet spot for whenever uh, have the your to accomplish BI work 
and you got all these different sources. And uh, 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 but I I really like that quote and wanted to <laughs> wanted to comment on it. Thanks. I uh, fully agree, and it's important that we make the distinction because otherwise. Uh, and we have, and it tends to be something we see a lot in BI. We tend to grab something and want to use it for everything. We feel not doing it 100%. We're not doing it. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, if we tools for what they're not, not intended for, we generally see what those consequences end up being. So, we'll talk a little about the data virtualization architecture. In the next few slides, we'll talk about what data virtualization is to give you a little bit more understanding of how it works and what it does. But really, the architecture around a data virtualization uh, is generally there's, there's systems that or source uh, data that lies below the virtualization layer. And there's a protocol layer that, in essence, is how the virtualization product communicates with the underlying data sources. Those protocols could be ODBC, JDBC, it could be SOAP, it could be a different protocols for interacting with the different data sources. And then generally have a security access layer that sits right above that, which really is controlling security down to the data sources themselves. Now, all the data virtualization products have a query engine. The query engine is much like a query engine you might find in a database, where there's a text optimizer and it parses the, the statements that come in and then determines what the right actual access path and most efficient ways of accessing that data are or is. And, and Products also have a caching engine, meaning that for large data sources, for ones that maybe change a little bit less often, or where uh, you have there's a need to bring data for specific applications and control the volatility of that data, there's a caching engine where you can actually build caches upon the online data, the virtual views that you've created, and a generally a metadata layer where we can define items and access the, for those views that are the definitions of those views. And then utilize that and read that throughout the architecture. And above having access, there's generally a user access security layer and then a protocol layer to actually talk to the consumers of the application. So work with the front end tools, like the business objects or the micro strategies or any of the front end tools out in the marketplace, as well as ad hoc tools, as well as web services. So there's generally a protocol layer that lies at the top of the virtualization stack, and that's really for for communications with the consumers. Now, how does virtualization work? work? Well, you have, a, you have a, an ad hoc query, and you're just doing a select statement across a few different data sources. So within actual virtualization tool, you'll see that as a view. Present it as a view, to either to the tool or to a, to a service. There's a query that's initiated. And that query sends it down to the virtualization layer. The virtualization layer actually sends it down to the data sources, consolidates it, and brings it back to the report. Now, you may have a more complex query that goes across different, additional different types of data sources, and there may be a large amount of data that we'd want to bring into a data source and consolidate that before we run join. And so the query is run down from the, data, from the actual requesting application, the data is then moved throughout the different sources, brought back to the actual data virtualization layer, and then the results are brought back to that Porter dashboard. Now, people that I talk to at conferences or some of our customers will not really understand how that actually ends up looking to a consuming application. And really, the best way to describe it is it really does look like a database. It looks like a if a database, if you go into an ad hoc query tool or if you can, if you import from a front-end application, really what it's like is that you're logging into a database into different schemas. And that's how the different virtualization products present the data to the consuming applications. As I mentioned, it's abstracted. So you only have, you have one way you can interact with it, and, and it shows it as it, what I would consider to be really a database. And so the way you can think of virtualization is that it's really presenting a layer as a virtual consolidated or integrated database. Now, one of the things that is very, is data about the virtualization side and why it, it really enables us to integrate data from a variety of different sources from a full perspective is that we can build layers. And those are views that are built on top of other views. Now, that's 
that's different from actual database views is that you can define, for instance, joins in virtual views, and those joins may, may not happen depending on whether you need to both tables. And so they're more efficient than creating a database view because the manager is much smarter about what data it needs to go after. Uh, so it isolates the changes. But you can build views that build the logic within each of the different views and consumes for other, other views. And the real magic to designing a semantic view of, or what a lot of people like to call a canonical view of the, of the, um, the architecture is that it presents it in a business-friendly way and helps isolate changes to the fewest number of objects. So old data virtualization architectures generally will build a, a, a layer model, and we'll see that in a moment. So we get architecture, and we start talking about use cases. And, 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 I, and I have three cases to present. There's many more we can use with data virtualization, but one is really what I consider to be the augmented data warehouse. And I mentioned we use federation technology or federation technology 12 years ago. This is what we did with it. And it's much more viable today because of where technology has come. Essentially, you can query data from the enterprise data warehouse as well as external data from either an ERP system or maybe even an Excel spreadsheet, create an import view and then a business view of that of, of, of that information. And then that information, for instance, if you have a customer or a extension, and just augment it, additional attributes to that coming from the operational sources and present that as one dimension. Now, doing that is the difference between doing the entire development cycle for EL and physicalizing the data and putting it through all those layers versus just actually to the virtual query from the other data sources. And so it's very, very quick. It's doing a matter of, of versus days and weeks. And so you can very quickly augment the data warehouse with data from other operational systems very quickly. Second case is creating a virtual data mart. So you, you can create an enterprise, or you, can, you can bring an enterprise data warehouse. You can enhance it or not enhance it, depending on what you want to do within the virtual layer. And start building out virtual data marts rather than physicalizing that data, which we see a lot in our architectures, where we're physically moving that from the enterprise data warehouse into a data mart. In this case, what we're doing is we're just building views on top of the data warehouse that actually bring that data into a, a, to a star denormalized schema, or sometimes snowflake schema, depending on the front-end tool that you're using. So we can actually start virtualizing that versus physicalizing it. And use caching strategies to even physicalize some of it, but not all of it. And that very, very quickly, and obviously changes can be made very, very quickly. There's really around operational reporting, and we're seeing that a lot today. The lays are coming down. Organs want to start bringing data in a lot faster, but the challenges we have with data integration architectures are that we've got to move that data through the integration architectures. And it's as if, for anyone that's tried reduce latency in your warehouse to near real time, it's not just a matter of your batches at, you know, in, in shorter intervals, it's actually you have to re-architect, and it's not always easy to bring that data in because it's not always available. So we get in directly from the operational source, and as you see in the side, it's the transactional system. It could be a replication of the, the transactional system. We want to mitigate some of the impact on the source system itself. And so a lot of our customers, we're helping them with how to get data in more real time and not impacting the source systems to the extent that if we go directly at them, because that's a lot, it tends to be a hurdle in a lot of organizations. Build an operational view, and the beauty of it is that we can start adding some of that business names, for instance, to to the field that may not, you know, may, might be in a in a very IT or non-business friendly name, whether it's a table name or an attribute name, and we build that canonical view that the business understands, and then present that as operational reporting. So now, I hear this, this question a lot, why are we seeing an upsurge in data virtualization? Well, it's not just about getting things faster. It's also about the technology that's enabling it. And I mentioned we used it about 12 years ago. Well, instead of running queries across a network and 
and the types of computers, the amount of memory we had and CPU, it wasn't as viable as it is today. Today, our networks are a lot faster. We have more cores in our CPUs. We have 64-bit operating systems, a lot more memory, and this is a lot faster. We're seeing decreases in cost of memory. We're also effectiveness of query optimization for data virtualization is much further beyond where it is today. Concepts like semi-joins, concepts like projection, concepts that we have back then, but we have today, and actually reduce the amount of data moving across the network. We're all seeing just unbelievable increase in the number of disparate data sources and types of data that we're seeing in the organization. It's no longer just a few different relational systems and maybe a mid-range that we're bringing data from. Now we have cloud-based software. We have a different types of data. We have unstructured data. We have Hadoop. We have all different types of systems that we didn't have back then, and so we're managing that. And assessing those can be very difficult. So abstracting that is very, very important. Um, so, you know, we've talked about it uh, throughout this presentation, and that's Boy, you know, users just aren't willing to wait, and a big part of that is they have other options. They had other options, but today the options are even easier. They can buy desktop analytic tools. They can go out and, and, and to uh, software as a service provider, and they can implement these things on their own. The challenge of that, which we've all encountered, is one that it always ends up back on our laps in the BI group, and two, it's I always want data from other systems. And so into that sort of that, that wall where they get it from another system, but they can't get it in that application that they have. Additional sort of lean and that what I call lean, but agile and lean benefits maintain single semantic layers for all consuming applications, and that's important. The amount of time we spend maintaining business rules in multiple places is challenging, to say the least. We can actually build all those rules in one place and not to be, when we, when we use the business rules, making changes in multiple places. And, and a lot of what happens is they get paid in one or two different systems, but not all the places, and then people walk in with different reports, different information on those reports. We can maintain a single secure access layer. We can QA efforts by providing data for QA rather than having to self-generate it. And a lot of times when we self-generate data for testing, data is not necessarily representative of the underlying data, so they miss a lot of uh, the K, um, things that they would normally catch. We, we have ways where we can audit usage and performance, so we can see all the that are coming in throughout the organization and start evaluating what people are truly looking at. We can deploy boxes very, very easily by just providing areas for people to access data. And then if the need is to physicalize that, at that point, we could physicalize it. Chain detection becomes very easy because we can start seeing throughout the impacts when we make changes through those virtual layers where those impacts are. And we can start reducing the, the number of actual ETL jobs that we have in the organization that we have to monitor. And in a lot of cases, people waking up in the middle of the night to fix those ETL jobs that in a lot of cases are always even loading a lot or doing a lot of transformations to the data. And the benefits, there are business benefits beyond what's on the slide. Really important ones, I think, are faster prototyping and exploratory analysis. And that really starts bringing the business back into the equation throughout the projects that we have. Business can be involved from the definition phase all the way through the deployment phase because they're looking at the data and they're actually looking at that underlying data and seeing as, you make, as we're making changes, they can see the changes in real time rather than waiting until we physicalize it and deploy it. We talked about common business rules, but that's you know, that thing that's not to understate. Being able to have common business rules that everybody can see and has access to is very important because not everybody is going accessing our data warehouses or accessing the data through the same tools. We like to think they are, but we know they're not. They're using Microsoft Excel, they're using the front end BI tools, they're using desktop analytic tools services, there's a lot of ways people are accessing data and they're not getting all the same business rules. We can all control latency. We can have all the audit data access where we're trying to, where there's uh, requirements around 
security and compliance, we can actually provide auditing to all the data sources people are going after and bringing data back. We provide access to real-time data, and we can deliver a lot faster. The last point is we can start providing exactness back to the data source. And when we talk about data quality, we talk about exactness and correctness. Exactness is a big aspect to a lot of companies because in a lot of cases, they're making critical decisions off their source data, and it has to be exact. And the fewer times we physically move that data, the more exact we can guarantee that data is. At this point, I'll turn it over to Tim. Tim's going to talk about uh, Informatica and how actually Informatica's data virtualization product works and some aspects behind uh, how we manage it and, and, and what development cycles are with their tool. If you have any more information, you can contact me at either you can follow me on Twitter at Steve Dine or you can contact me via my email address or, or call me on my direct line. With that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. And uh, now. I'll spend it over to me. So uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Tim Smith, a senior product specialist at AMAC. Uh, um, I've been working in data virtualization for um, over three, almost four years now. And um, uh, what I was asked to talk a little bit about today is how Informatica addresses uh, this problem of Agile BI, or, or that is, improve that solution of Agile BI. As Steve uh, mentioned, the, the problem with um, BI today is there is no company, there is no one that only has one BI tool. Usually many different tools being used out there, Excel being probably one of the biggest uh, used BI tools out there. And because there are so many different uh, BI tools being used, um, we talked with our customers. We found that, that there were big issues of consistencies. Consistency, you'd run a report in uh, business objects, you'd get one value. You'd run something in uh, microstrategy, you'd get a, a different value. And um, getting able to trace that down uh, was a, a big hassle. Also, a lot of data was getting replicated. So, <clears throat> in order to quickly deliver data, IT would uh, provide extracts and got shadow IT. Um, uh, the business is going to get the work done regardless of, uh, of uh, what IT says. So these projects get queued up or they're going to take um, you know, two to three months a, as everyone responded. Uh, so if, if it's going to take that long, well, I'm going to get my job done. I'm just going to get the extract. I'll go get data myself, stand up a little micro. Microsoft SQL database and, and solve the problem. So uh, they yielded a, a bunch of issues. As Steve mentioned, um, those systems end up often getting put back onto um, IT or, or the BI team to maintain. And it's just too much to deal with. So uh, there's no reuse on, on any of uh, the work that's being done. Someone solves the problem in one tool, uh, it's not there for another tool. Um, and not just the, not just a, a BI, uh, Informatica looks at this very differently than a lot of software vendors. We really look at data virtualization as not a solution. This is an aspect of data integration. It's really more strategic than just solving these, these uh, BI problems. So though we are focusing on uh, BI today, the same issues occur with um, with all your data integration. So our goal is to really solve the problem in a, a broader uh, strategic data integration uh, layer. So that then can provide the common access across all the different BI tools, all everything being used, one place to manage it, one place to uh, find out your lineage, who's using what, and uh, deliver consistency and, and also so all the transformation capability that I know many of our attendees are current Informatica customers. So um, all of the power that you've gotten used to using in Informatica to transform, um, uh, standardize, improve the quality of your data, that is available in this layer. So 
when we look at this, we we then say, let's take this issue where we're doing these transformations throughout all these different systems, sometimes in the consuming application, sometimes in the process, and let's bring that all into one layer. So we're going to call this now the data services layer. And now we can do the transformation and, and providing that data in a standard model, a consistent model, uh, a, a data scheme uh, 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 model. And then we can, we can provide a process to uh, transform it, provide in the model, and expose it through SQL. Reuse this through batch processes, expose it through web services, and we get consistency across the spectrum. Everyone gets the same results, get reuse of all the logic that we're putting together to um, make data consistent and, and clean it up. Now, I think there are a few uh, technical people out there, so I started out with a uh, um, data services architecture, but I thought, you know, most of this is not actually that interesting. Let's just talk about how consumers, how users use this type of software. With ECHO, we, we look at um, things. That it, we don't just have one type of user. We look at uh, developer users. The developer users are um, users that they tend to write more complex scripts. They'll, they'll uh, write a, a um, complex transformation. They deal with the, the heavy lifting. But there are also the analyst type users. And for the analyst users, where with the developer users, we provide a, um, uh, an app-based UI and, and provide user interface to um, design these models. For the analyst users, we want to make it easy for them to uh, find the data that they want to, uh, want to work with and to get access to it. Uh, so essentially, if we have given uh, users um, uh, if we grant them rights to uh, data, then they should be able to put together their own views of data. I'll be able to register their own views of data. You have a lot of analysts that need to not just pull information from data that's out there in all of the database systems that the enterprise has, but also to pull in um, uh, external systems like uh, if you've got uh, partners providing data via CSV files or something like that, that needs to be integrated as well. So a way for them to work with it. And then you've got your consuming applications. And the way we expose these different models, the data that the developer and analysts are putting together, they can access that through ODBC or JDBC and also through web services. So it's it uh, um, easy for uh, any of these applications to then consume these different data sources, whether they're relational or mainframe or, or wherever that data is coming from. The Informatica customers are uh, always happy to see that the user interface is very familiar to them. The, they can get in and create a, a uh, model, reuse a lot of the logic that they've already built in their best processes, and they're not writing SQL. Um, uh, with the, some systems, uh, there's the ability to use create a visual uh, presentation, but that works with a very small uh, amount of SQL. As soon as you start getting a big SQL, it uh, it starts to fall down. You you have a lot of work to do. You end up writing manual SQL. Informatica has always been about avoiding um, manual coding as much as possible. So complexity can now be dealt with in a, a visual user interface. Also, in yes, you could also uh, physically you could also uh, export that virtual thing into Power Right. So um, as as I showed in an earlier slide, this ability to reuse across all the data integration layers. So if you're using Power Center, this model can be used in the Power Center engine just as it is in the uh, data virtualization engine. And what it means is that your large volume processes can still be managed. You can use the same model. If you started with one of the um, their data virtualization software, typically first you write in SQL, and second, when you start putting a high load on it, it can't manage it. There's too, uh, too much data. Um, and then you end up rewriting it. 
And sometimes you don't know that you have that problem until you have it. In other words, you say, okay, this makes sense for data virtualization, and I'm going to create this virtual database, and I, I uh, deploy it out, and everyone starts to use it, and then we find out that the data volume is far more than, than the system can handle. With Informatica, we are, we are able to take this logic and use it, uh, put it right into uh, the power center's engine, and you've done 80 to 90 percent of your work. All your QA work is done. The base logic is done. The model is done. So you just have a little bit of additional uh, work to do. So it's really nice to be able to transition. You can go both ways because we use this. Um, it's all in the metadata. We also provide uh, the tools for the developers to be more effective, more efficient. We do uh, profiling of the sources uh, with full drill, drill down and pattern recognition um, uh, types, business uh, uh, types like, uh, um, like for example, a, a credit card number or personal health information can be automatically detected in, in a profile. Um, and it's not just profiling the source of the data or your virtual database. You can profile logic. So an individual piece of logic that you are building, you can validate it before you've even deployed it. So it's all about for ability, it's all about having a, a, a shorter time cycle to deliver this and uh, making the developers much more efficient. Now, Self-service is something else that Informatica uh, saw as being um, uh, neglected. Um, the business users, you know, we're software vendors often solve the problem from a technical perspective, but um, not from a, uh, a business user perspective or vice versa. So what we wanted to do was provide as much capability as possible for the end users to do their own uh, self-service consumption of the data. What we did is said, let's see how we can involve the business uh, users as, uh, through the whole process, but especially early on. So what we do is we allow them to create their specifications instead of using Word or Excel and, and writing the specifications in. They can use a uh, UI that, that is uh, is e for them easier for them to use than a, a um, a development type UI. If you think about what most people do, if you think about what most data is about, even when you're moving data from one system to another, you're doing really a lot of joining, looking up data, a few expressions to train, to manipulate the data, just very basic um, is Usually most of the work is not actually uh, complex. So what we do is we allow them in a simpler UI to get um, to get their data, to then do the same type of profiling and analysis on it that the developer does without having to use a more complex and, and flexible UI and deploy it. So without IT's intervention, they're able to get access to their own data. And developers uh, can be engaged later to work on that same uh, logic. Um, they can, uh, because this is all within the same system, it's all the same metadata, they can leverage those same assets the, that the analysts are creating, and likewise the analysts can leverage the assets that IT creates when they're doing ETL work or doing more complex data virtualization work. So uh, cross-pollinization, the, the, the use across the spectrum is you know, a huge thing for uh, for the enterprise to be able to leverage. And finally, with IT, they're also able to take, again, those same assets that are being generated and move that out into the, uh, the operational processes using ETL or, or other processes. The interface that the analyst uses or the business user is a web browser-based UI. And it's more of a wizardy UI. It walks them through selecting the different sources and joining them and, and looking up additional data. So this is a, a, a easy to access UI. There's no deployment that you have to go through. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to work with. 
So I'll get started. Uh, when you've got these projects that are coming up, it's easy to say, you know, oh, we can do it quicker with data virtualization. But when you talk about really applying Agile BI, how do you make that more effective and efficient? I buy those projects that you're going to um, uh, attack, and then uh, talk about some of the issues that you're already dealing with with previous projects and current projects. So that is uh, issue of quality being in the data. Um, you know, you have if you're pulling data from many different data sets, standardizing those and and being efficient at that, having the business involved throughout the process instead of at the start to do what they want and at the end to tell the tell you that you deliver what they asked for. Um, the end result is that by using data virtualization with um, with your BI process, you're going to be able to deliver much quicker and get quicker ROI and, and a shorter time to delivery on your um, uh, BI projects. So I'll uh, end with some um, sources of information. We've got a uh, data virtualization corner that is a, a good source. We've also got a group on LinkedIn for uh, data virtualization. And uh, I, I suggest that you go out and look at some of these uh, um, some of these uh, web pages and pull additional information. As, as Steve said, um, he has a, a Twitter you can follow. So there are lots of uh, sources of information. And of course, Informac is always here, and, and uh, a, a Steve group is here to help with uh, uh, any, uh, any of your projects that you need assistance with. So I'd like to open up to uh, for any questions that you might have at this point. So uh, we'll pause for a moment. Um, you've got a QA tab there, and um, I think uh, I think uh, Tony, there's is there a way that they can so uh, uh, talk on the on the call? And ask. Yes, there is. There is. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, simply press star the, the number one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Again, that's star one to ask an audio question. And as a reminder, you may also ask a question through your web console. Locate the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Type in your question and click send to submit. Also, so the polling question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Keeping me honest. <laughs> So what we were uh, wanting, there's a uh, when you attack data virtualization, there's usually some uh, concerns that that pop up as you know if I do data virtualization, how <clears throat> how is that going to um, impact um, operational systems or will it perform well or security? So we have uh, have some selections here of of the questions that pop up up and wanted to get your input. And while filling it out, I did see one, one question come across uh, the Q&A, and that was uh, that, you know, could data virtualization only work on small volumes of data? Um, and if there's large volumes of data, does that mean you have to move to ETL? So, Lou, there, Tim, why don't you address it, and I'll jump in as well if, uh, if you want to start. Sure. Uh, um, well, <clears throat> that's one of the problems that we saw is that uh, people were using data virtualization and with some trepidation because we commit to a certain uh, architectural style of uh, delivering the data, it's uh, costly usually to back out of that and change your mind and uh, go down a different path. And that goes both ways. It's not just uh, uh, if you choose to go data virtualization, but let's say that you choose to use ETL and you move through, um, uh, you go through the project lifecycle and you deliver through ETL, and as usual, at the end, um, you find out uh, now the latency isn't what we need. You know, you, you took the two or three months to deliver it, now we need it instead of a uh, one hour latency. We now, now need it real time. So, it's, 
there's really no one else. I I try to be. I, I hate sounding, but um, there's no one else that can do this. This is the ability to Informatica provides this ability to essentially switch. It's kind of a marketing term to say you can just push a button and switch. You can't just switch with a button, but it is. All the logic is done. All your uh, quality work is done. You've tested uh, the logic and, and validated. <clears throat> and to be able to out later that you've uh, uh, maybe that you need to change the mode of data delivery, uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it frees you up. You don't have to spend quite so much time uh, figuring it out. So you have to say, well, what's that, that break? Point. You know, do I move to ETL? You can find that out later. You can go ahead and deploy it virtually. In fact, one of my recommendations is for customers doing ETL that they first take the approach of doing uh, data virtualization. In other words, prototype it first. Do ETL prototyping. And then give the customer, your end user, the ability to go ahead and test the uh, the model test your logic. Make sure the data is there that they understood the data correctly. And at the end, when they approve it, they say yes, this this meets your our requirements. You can then ask them, okay, is, is the performance acceptable? Yes. Okay, I'm done. If I had planned on doing this as an ETL project, I'm able to done at that point because the customer has accepted the uh, delivery. And uh, they say that the performance is, is is fine. And there's going to be some things that perform well and some things that don't. That's just the way it is. doesn't matter what you, you know, uh, software you use. That's always going to be the case. So we, uh, I like being able to provide that flexibility to, to do one or the other. We have a, a poll results here. Um, and it looks like we have a fairly even split. Uh, we've got uh, managing organizing and managing the sources. So just dealing with the load of all of these uh, sources is the uh, is biggest on the mind, but, but pretty close to everything else, performance, impact on operational systems, and data quality. Can you just tell us real quickly on um, just to what you were saying and, and maybe a tap from a different realm. You mentioned earlier that it's really, you know, it's a tool in the tool belt and you know, use it for the right purpose. Also, an art to what we do, and part of that is understanding workload and understanding you know, what we're trying to do with the data and where the data exists, and that's part of the profiling and how much data do we have. But you know, essentially the volume of data. I mean, you, you, you can you know, tackle extremely large uh, volumes with data virtualization and put a lot of that work down onto the database, which is what we try and do on the virtualization side. So it's really more about the type of query that's being run. Um, you know, not all sources you're going after you even are in a database. So sometimes the sources are flat files and they can be very large. Um, so it really, I hate to be a consultant and say it depends, but it really does depend on, on the type of queries you're trying to run and the, the types of data you're going after. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a low, you, know, you can only use it on low volumes of data because what you need to look out for, for is how much data is being joined together uh, between the different systems or the different sources uh, is how much data is being returned back to the end user. We had a couple of other questions on uh, on here. Let's see, a, a question about uh, can data virtualization be done on structured and unstructured data? It, it can. Um, it works on both. The uh, Another question was during data virtualization, where do you keep or store data after ETL processes? Um, the, so data virtualization is not about storing data. It's really about uh, delivering usually small uh, segments, usually requests. Like if I run a BI report, I go get the data, I uh, clean it and, and, um, and resolve it uh, with other sources of data and return that data set, and I'm done. It doesn't get stored. Uh, as Steve said, you can use caching techniques to um, improve performance and to uh, um, uh, rid the load uh, on the operational systems during certain times. So in that case, it was stored, 
standard, but you don't have the DBA involved. They just allocate so much space and they work with it. So uh, I hope that answers your question. And the next question, does tool integrate with Metadata Manager? That is being released here in December. I actually am using it right now with Metadata Manager. So yes, um, full lineage uh, support. Are there any other questions? I think we're at the end of the hour, but uh, any other questions? Any other questions at this time? Thank you. Great. All right. I think we're out of time. We're at 1 o'clock, um, or at least 1 o'clock in mountain time, <laughs> depending on where your time zone is. So I appreciate it, Tim. Uh, it was great. I think it was a great discussion and great presentation. Great, Steve, and uh, appreciate your uh, attending and, and leading. Uh, everyone, thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure there will be a follow-up email um, with a, a link to information. So thank you for attending, and uh, I think we'll, we'll go shut it down now. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference. You may now disconnect.